these sampling distributions. The Seattle Epidemiology Research and Information Center, in collaboration with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA Employee Education System, and the University of Washington Department of Epidemiology present the 2002 VA Epidemiology Summer Session. Good day. My name is Gail Reiber. I'm the director of the VA Summer Epidemiology Program. I'm also a professor of epidemiology of health services and at the University of Washington. Today we're going to be continuing our course in general biostatistics. Dr. Marie Diener West will be presenting. Dr. Diener West is a professor of biostatistics at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore and she will be discussing today common statistical methods. Dr. Diener West. Thank you. Okay, well where I'd like to start today is um, reviewing the homework. And uh, recall that yesterday our topic, one of our topics was looking at sample size. And we looked at sample size from both the um, points of view of both, um, we looked at sample size from the points of view of both estimation as well as hypothesis testing. So let's look at this with um, respect to a few of the homework problems. One of the homework problems questions was how large a sample would be required to measure serum testosterone levels to within plus or minus 0.05 micrograms per deciliter in the group of heavy smokers. In the, in the example that we had looked at yesterday that was looking at mean testosterone level by category of smoking. And um, what we knew was that based on our data, the um, standard deviation of the serum testosterone levels in the group of heavy smokers was um, about 0.15 micrograms per deciliter. So based on this estimate from our data, if we were to perform another study in, in which we are looking at this just from an estimation point of view with an interest in trying to derive a precise estimate, an estimate to within plus or minus 0.05 micrograms per deciliter, how many, how large of a sample of heavy smokers would we require? So what we would like is to be able to, at the end of the study, calculate a 95% confidence interval for mean serum testosterone level. Um, that's plus or minus 0.05 units. So in other words, what we'd like is to be able to construct a 95% confidence interval that's of width two times 0.05 or 0.1 micrograms per deciliter. So from an estimation point of view, our sample size would be derived just based on our desire to have a fairly precise estimate, one that re results in a confidence interval that's only 0.1 micrograms per deciliter wide. So keep in mind that when we construct a confidence interval based on a mean, we take the sample mean and add and subtract 1.96 times s over the square root of n. So, but you will recall that half the width of the confidence interval then would be 1.96 times the standard error. And so if half the interval is 1.96 times s over the square root of n, then we can um, set half the interval, our desired half of the interval of 0.05 equal to 1.96 times s over the square root of n. What's our estimate of s? What's our um, estimated standard deviation? It's the sample standard deviation that we had from the previous study of 0.15 micrograms per deciliter. And we would be able to then plug in 0.15 for s, uh, go through a little bit of algebra, just a little, to solve for the sample size n. And we would see that that would be 1.96 squared times 0.15 squared divided by 0.05 squared to result in a sample size of 35 men. So this says that if we had a sample size of 35 men and we calculated the sample mean testosterone level from this group and constructed a confidence interval, it should result in one that's approximately 0.10 micrograms per deciliter wide. Now suppose that um, our estimated standard deviation was actually 0.25 indicating higher variability in the measurements than um, the one we had of 0.15. What would happen to the sample size? 
we would see that the numerator would increase, so the sample size would necessarily increase. We actually would need 96 men, um, 96 heavy smokers. And suppose I ans ask the question in a different way. Suppose that I actually wanted a much narrower confidence interval, a 95% confidence interval of width 0.05 micrograms per deciliter rather than 0.10 micro micrograms per deciliter. Then what would happen? We change the denominator. So the denominator, instead of being 0.05, would be half of that, half of the width, which was 0.025. And our sample size would increase to 138 men. OK. So remember that this is sample size calculation that's based um, solely on estimation, not hypothesis testing. Now suppose that I'm interested in, in um, asking a different question. And that question um, is one that's phrased um, as a hypothesis test. So suppose that the question of interest is how large of a sample is required to test the null hypothesis that the true mean testosterone level was 0.6 micrograms per deciliter versus an alternative that the true mean was 0.55 micrograms per deciliter. So in other words, we have a null hypothesis that it's 0.60 and an alternative that is 0.05 units less, 0.55. So if we aimed to test that hypothesis, um, and why would we set up a hypothesis necessarily in this way? Any ideas? So we're interested, if we were interested in detecting a difference because we knew that some other group, say the group of non-smokers, had a mean testosterone level of 0.6, and we thought that smoking did influence testosterone level by decreasing it, we might be um, interested in detecting this decrease of 0.05 units. So we would have some rationale for choosing a decrease of 0.05, but if we had a null and an alternative that we could state in this way, then the delta of interest would be 0.6 minus 0.55 or 0.05. We'd assume um, the probability of a type 1 error equal to 0.05. We'd assume the probability of a type 2 error beta equal to 0.2. And then our sample size calculation depends on both alpha and beta, because we're in a hypothesis testing framework. It would depend on our estimate of variability, sigma squared, as well as the delta that we're interested in detecting. So here, we would use 1.96 corresponding to the z of alpha over 2, 0 0.84 corresponding to the z of 0.2 for beta, that quantity, that sum, and the quantity squared, times, again, we'll assume that our best guess at the uh, standard deviation is 0 0.15 units. So we'd square that, divide by the delta of 0.05 of interest squared. And if we go through the math, we would see that we, we would need approximately 71 men, heavy smokers, male heavy smokers, in order to um, be able to test this hypothesis versus this specific alternative. So what was the difference between the sample size that we got when we were just interested in estimation versus the sample size that we've um, calculated here? Anybody? Well, is this larger or smaller? It's larger, and it's larger because of the fact that we have a specific null and alternative hypothesis that we're interested in evaluating. So we're actually, we need to worry about making both a type 1 and a type 2 error. We've, um, we've looked at specifying um, a difference between possible population means, whereas the smaller sample size was just based on our desire to have a confidence interval of a certain width. So two different approaches. And uh, just to iterate as well that Conventionally, alpha is chosen as 0.05 and beta is chosen as 0.20, which means that 1 minus beta, or the statistical power to reject the null hypothesis when it's actually um, false, is 80%. 1 minus beta, or 0.8, or 80%. If we chose to minimize the probability of a type 2 error to 0.1, then we would have 90% statistical power, but the sample size would increase from 71 to approximately 95 men.
Okay, so looking at um, if z of beta corresponded to a smaller beta, the z of beta would be larger in the numerator and the sample size would result in 95. Okay, questions on those? Are those what you got when you calculated them at home? Oh, good. <laughs> so the um, last sample size question was one that was looking at a two-group comparison. And the question was, how large a sample is needed in each group in order to detect an average difference of 0.1 micrograms per deciliter between smokers, non-smokers, and heavy smokers. So two independent groups, non-smokers and heavy smokers. This is the question of interest. And uh, you were provided with some information to assume that the standard deviation uh, in non-smokers was 0.21 micrograms per deciliter. And the standard deviation in heavy smokers was 0.15 micrograms per deciliter. And these are assumed based on a previous study, a previous pilot study. So. Um, our aim is to detect this difference, or delta, of 0.1 micrograms per deciliter. We'll assume an alpha of 0.05 and a beta of 0.20. And now, how does the sample size calculation change? The way it changes is that um, we're dealing with two groups, so we worry about two standard deviations. And in fact, this n that we're calculating is the number that we would need in each group. So assuming equal sample sizes, the number that we would need in each group, uh, we would plug in the z corresponding to alpha over 2, z according, uh, corresponding to beta, um, sum those and square them. And then, given that our estimated standard deviations were 0.21 in one group and 0.15 in the other, we would plug in the estimated variances, um, multiply the numerator, divide by the delta we're interested in detecting of 0.1, square it, and what we would see is that we would need approximately 53 in each group. So the total sample size would be 106, would be 106. So uh, just a few variations, um, and this isn't showing up very well, so I'm going to redo it, but suppose that we wanted to detect a difference of only 0.05 instead of 0.10 micrograms per deciliter, what you would see is that you actually need about 209 men in each of these groups in order to detect this smaller difference. On the other hand, if we were interested in detecting a larger difference, 0.15 rather than 0.10, as you would imagine, the sample size is far reduced. We'd only need approximately 23 men in each group. So we see the um, sample size is certainly heavily influenced by the errors that we're aiming to um, minimize. It's, a, it's influenced by the variability in both groups, and it's also influenced by the difference that we're interested in detecting between groups, the magnitude of that difference. Okay, so this is um, where we left off last time. And today we have one more topic, and that topic is um, looking at looking at um, another common statistical method that's not multivariable. It's um, looking at two variables, and that's the topic of simple linear regression. So where we have been over the past few days is actually looking at methods for summarizing information about one group given that we have a continuous measurement, and often we look at means, or summarizing information about one group in the form of a dichotomous measure and looking at the proportion, or in um, looking at the association between a continuous measurement and a group. So we looked at differences in means between groups. We looked at the association between a characteristic and a group by looking at differences in proportions between groups. But what we haven't looked at yet is the uh, correlation between two continuous measures. So um, the, over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, we'll be looking at the relationship or correlation between two continuous measures, where we have measurements that are um, related in a straight line relationship. So we're going to look at this as the method of simple linear regression, which is using a technique called least squares that we'll um, discuss today. We'll see what the form of the straight line, um, 
the expression of the straight line relationship between two variables of interest. We'll see how to both calculate and interpret both the intercept and the slope of this um, straight line relationship. And then we'll conclude with an example. So we've already talked, as I mentioned, about association. And association is just the relationship that exists between um, two variables. But um, as we've already seen, the way we measure the association or the way we summarize it or the statistical methods that we use really depends on the nature of the variables. So we'll look at today how we can talk about the relationship between um, two continuous variables. But we know that we could have continuous variables such as height or weight. We might be interested in the association between a continuous variable and an ordinal variable such as um, birth weight category or APGAR score. We also know there are other variables that are nominal in nature, um, such as vital status, dead or alive, cancer treatment, treatment A, B, or C. And so the way in which we look at association between variables depends on whether we have a continuous and an ordinal, or a continuous and a nominal, or two ordinals, or two continuous variables. So already, we have looked at the use of the chi-squared statistic or alternatively the z-test, as a way of looking at the association between two nominal variables. So when we looked at two by two tables and we could express two dichotom the relationship or association between two dichotomous variables, we were, um, we were using the chi-squared test to make statistical inferences in hypothesis testing. Um, we also looked at the relationship between means, so between a continuous variable and a group, looking at t-tests to look at differences in means between groups. We extended it to more than two groups by looking at analysis of variance. And as well, if we had an R by C contingency table, we could look at the relationship between two categorical variables based on a chi-square. So we've actually looked at association already um, between different types of variables, but not yet have we looked at the relationship between two continuous variables, such as looking at the relationship between blood pressure and weight in, the, in a group of individuals. So we'll be looking at the Pearson correlation coefficient as a measure of the, um, the strength of a linear relationship between two continuous variables. There are other ways of looking at correlation or the um, joint ranking of two, um, two variables. And if we don't have two continuous variables, suppose we had a nominal variable and a continuous one, we could use a non-parametric um, correlation coefficient known as the Spearman rank correlation coefficient. And then there are other specialized ways of looking at agreements, say, between raters. Suppose there are two graders that are looking at pathology levels in, in the same specimens, and grader A versus grader B. We might be interested in the association between the gradings. And there's a special statistic called the Kappa statistic that looks at the association or the agreement between raters, but accounts for the agreement that we would get just by chance alone. So this is just a flavor of some of the other types of measures of association. What we'll be focusing on today is um, a linear relationship between two continuous variables. And our focus will be on the Pearson correlation coefficient. So what is correlation analysis when we're interested in the straight line relationship between two continuous variables? Um, correlation analysis really looks at the strength and direction of the relationship. So we'll focus on what this means, and then we'll move into the area of regression analysis, which is related to correlation analysis, but has the purpose of aiming to quantify the straight line relationship between two variables, and then use that straight line to predict or estimate the value of one variable based on the value of the other one. So we'll look at the distinction between correlation and regression analysis, um, especially, especially in respect to um, an example. So the very first thing, and I hope that this sticks in your minds, the very first thing is to always look at your data. No matter what data you have, look at your data. Visually inspect the data. And so if we visually inspected these three 
plots, we have two continuous variables, one labeled as x, the other as y. So you can think of each of these dots as representing two variables, two measurements on the same person. So think of x as being um, weight and y as being blood pressure. So if we were interested in seeing whether there was a linear relationship between two variables, we could look at this plot. What do we see in this first plot? Just a lot of noise, random scatter, indicating no clear linear relationship. Whereas the middle graph shows a downward trend, but we see that, that as x increases, the value of y decreases in a straight line, what appears to be visually a straight line relationship. So here's where we would have a negative correlation between two variables x and y. Whereas in the final panel, we see that as the value of x increases, the value of y also increases, indicating a positive linear correlation between these two variables. So how can we, how can we use a statistic to measure the strength of this linear relationship? Well, there's something known as the Pearson or the sample correlation coefficient, r, which is calculated from the data, from the observed data. Um, it's important to keep in mind that it actually has no units associated with it. So um, it takes on values between positive 1 and negative 1. And it doesn't matter if we're looking at weight measured in pounds and blood pressure measured in millimeters or weight measured in kilograms and blood pressure measured in some other units. Um, what we would see is that if there was no association, just a random scatter of points, the, the um, correlation coefficient would take on values near 0. So a value of 0 means no association, complete random scatter. Whereas a value of r, the sample correlation coefficient equal to positive 1, would indicate perfect positive correlation or association, meaning that every point falls exactly on a straight line. And an r of negative 1 would indicate perfect negative correlation, every point falling exactly on a straight line with a negative slope. And then again, there are um, guidelines for interpretation of these correlation coefficients. Um, a value from 0 to 0.25 would indicate little or no relationship. 0.25 to 0.5 would indicate fair. 0.5 to 0.75, moderate to good. And 0.75 to 1 would indicate very good to excellent um, correlation. And those can be either positive or negative in direction. Now again, remember these are just guidelines. Just as we had a discussion before with p-values that the adjectives that are used are ones that are um, arbitrary. So these, again, are also ones that are, are arbitrary. OK. Well, I think it's, um, it's important to realize that a correlation coefficient can mean different things depending on the data set. And I like these examples because this one shows the perfect positive correlation where r is equal to 1. All of those points fall perfectly on a straight line. The one next to it shows a perfect um, correlation, negative correlation. All the points fall exactly on a straight line. We see here a random scatter of points. The correlation coefficient would be 0. This is a, a graph that shows a correlation coefficient somewhere between 0 and 1. So we know there's a positive correlation. We see there's, they don't fall exactly on a straight line. So what would you guess this correlation would be? Something over the greater than 0.5, possibly. And, and the same with the next one. We see that there's a negative correlation. As x increases, y decreases. But there's scatter away from a straight line. So again, probably a value that's somewhere around Point five, negative 0.5. Now, look at these two examples. We already said that the random scatter shown in the top graph would be represented by a correlation of 0, correlation coefficient of 0. What would happen if we had actually a pattern like this and computed this sample statistic that's known as a correlation coefficient? We would see that actually this is an example in which the correlation coefficient is equal to 0. Well, we know there's not, a, there's not a linear relationship. But if we had only computed the correlation coefficient and didn't look at the data, would we have been able to distinguish this relationship on the top graph from the intermediate one? No. And so it's important to look at the data. We see this curvilinear relationship that we would miss if we had only looked at the summary statistic. 
Um, also, the correlation coefficient is influenced by outliers. So here we see an example where there doesn't appear to be a relationship between x and y, but what's up here in the upper right-hand corner? One point that influences the value of the correlation coefficient. So look at your data. Here as well, we see a curvilinear relationship. There's a plateauing going on with increasing values of x. We wouldn't have seen that if we had only looked at the summary measure. And this is one of my favorites. If we calculated the correlation coefficient for this entire data set, we would see that as x increases, y tends to decrease. But in fact, there are these three separate subgroups or strata in which if we looked at each of these individually, there's actually a positive relationship. So look at your data. Well, let's um, talk about the situation in which we've inspected the data and there appears to be a straight line relationship. Um, we would possibly be interested in using some of our tools of statistical inference by hypothesis testing. There are methods for testing the null hypothesis that, that the true correlation coefficient in the population rho is equal to zero. So if one rejected this null hypothesis, one would conclude that there is some correlation between the two variables. And again, we could construct a 95% confidence interval for the true population correlation coefficient based on the data. So we'd, we would use the sample correlation value of R, construct an interval around it. I'm not going into the details with respect to the methodology or what the standard error would be. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than the ones we've looked at already, but it's all a variation on the same theme. We would interpret the result of the hypothesis test and we would interpret the um, confidence interval in the same way that we have interpreted others. So let's um, look at how we would construct a straight line relationship or estimate a straight line, the best straight line, through a set of points, x and y. And the simple linear regression is a um, a relationship or a linear relationship that describes a response measure that we'll call y, the outcome or the dependent variable, as a linear function of an explanatory variable x. So that explanatory variable x we can call the independent variable, the um, covariate of interest. And our goal then is to be able to describe a straight line relationship and then potentially predict or estimate the value of the outcome y based on the value of x. So I'm going to ask you to recall some high school geometry and algebra. So if you recall, if you were asked what's the form of a straight line, the form of a simple straight line where we have one variable x and one variable y, um, the, the form of that straight line is that y equals um, a y-intercept that we call beta, b naught plus b1, where b1 is the slope, times x. So do you recall what these stand for? If you don't, we'll review them. b naught is actually the y-intercept, meaning it's the value of y when x is equal to 0. And b1 is the slope. Another way of thinking of that is that it's the change in y per unit change in x. So I could take any two points, suppose I have two measurements, blood pressure and weight, on two individuals, so I have a very small data set of only two, but the first point, x1, y1, would indicate the weight and then y would be the blood pressure for patient one. And if I had a second point, x2, y2, in which we have x2 is the, is the weight for patient two and y2 is the blood pressure, we could just take the difference um, in y, so y2 minus y1, the change in y, divided by the change in x, x2 minus x1, and that would give us the slope. So this was just a refresher on slope, just to make sure you all remember that. So if um, we have a straight line relationship, look at the bottom panel. Suppose we have some observations. We have these points, these observations, and we would like to be able to estimate the best fitting straight line through that, 
through that set of points. Now, if each of us had the same set of points and we tried to draw a straight line through those points, how many different lines would we get? As many lines as people in this room, because just by eye, we would all fit different lines. The um, method of least squares is one that says, what we'd like to minimize is the distance, the sum of the square distances between each point and the line. So we'd like to find the line that if we summed the differences, and I only have four points here, but think of the differences between the point and the line, the point and the line, point and the line, point and the line. If, if I took those differences, squared them, and used a little bit of calculus, I'd be able to derive the best fitting line that minimizes the dif distances from the points to the line. So um, what we see here are the points, and we see this estimated regression line that's using two coefficients, namely the intercept and the slope, to represent the best fitting line. So it's this line that we're interested in. Beta naught will consider the true population y-intercept. Beta 1 is the true population slope. And there are a couple of assumptions that underlie this technique. Um, there's a handy acronym for remembering the assumptions. They spell out the word line. So if you're looking at a simple linear regre regression, the acronym line means, first of all, there appears to be a linear relationship between x and y. Not a curvilinear relationship, not one that, that um, plateaus. Um, we'll also assume that all of the observations are independent. So if I have 25 individuals in this study, their weights and blood pressures won't influence the weights and blood pressures of the others. Um, we'll also assume that for um, the x variable, so if we're interested in x as weight, that there's a distribution for every weight, there's a distribution of blood pressures for that weight that's normally distributed. And that for each of those, the variability in blood pressure for each weight has equal variance. So these are assumptions that go into this methodology, assumptions that we can check with different diagnostic techniques and, and um, tools. Um, but we are assuming that if we looked at a blood pressure of 110, that there's a corresponding, um, if we looked at a weight of 110 pounds, there's a corresponding distribution of blood pressures around a mean blood pressure in which there's um, equal variance for every particular value of x. Does that make somewhat sense? So we're going to assume that the variability in blood pressure for somebody who weighs 110 pounds is the same as the variability in blood pressure for someone who weighs 150 pounds. It might not be true, and we might have to check those assumptions and do something about it, but that is the assumption. So what's the best fitting line? In English, this is what, just what I said before, that we're aiming to find the best line by finding the estimates of the intercept and the slope that minimize the sum of the square differences between the points and the best fitting line. So in other words, we're minimizing the sum of the squared error terms. The error we consider to be the distances between the best fitting line and the observation. So. Does that make sense to everyone? So there's a methodology. This is as technical as I'm going to get today in terms of how you would solve um, for the coefficients, the estimated coefficients. But if we had a data set in which we could calculate the average x and the average y, and if we were able to sum up the product of x times y across all observations, calculate the average x, the average y, actually sum up the squared x values. So these are all derived using calculus, but the first thing we would solve for would be the slope, the estimated slope that we would get by plugging in these values. We'll go through an example to make some sense. And then once we have the estimated slope, we just look at the average y minus the estimated slope times the average x to get the estimated intercept. So. Let me take you to an example to make some sense of this. This is actually the first linear regression. Um, Sir Francis Galton had a study in which he was looking at the heights. Um, he had a very large database, a very unique database, that was looking at the heights of fathers and their sons. 
So think of each observation was the pair of father and son heights. And here's a graphic of it. It's showing father's height in inches and son's height in inches. Does there appear to be a linear relationship? Yes. Does there appear to be sort of equal variance um, for each given father's height? Is the variability in son's height about the same? We can't really tell because we don't have a lot of points plotted here. But if you saw sort of the same spread around each value of x, you would include, uh, conclude there was equal variance. And so Galton found that the form of this straight line relationship was that y equals an intercept of 33.7 inches plus 0 0.52 times the father's height. So the predicted son's height was this linear function of x, the father's height. Well, how do we interpret that? So we're interpreting y as the son's height, x as the father's height. b naught, the estimated intercept, is literally interpreted as the expected son's height when the father's height is 0 inches. Now, does this make sense? Well, it doesn't make sense in terms of the fact that most fathers aren't zero inches, but it, is the, it makes sense in terms of the interpretation of the straight line, which if we extrapolated it down, when, zero was equal, when the father's height was equal to zero, we would see that um, the value of y is 33.7. There are ways of making that intercept more interpretable by centering the value of father's height, um, just by shifting it by its mean, but, but most of the time we're not so worried about the interpretation of the intercept. We're more worried about the interpretation of the slope. So if there was no change in um, son's height per unit one inch change in father's height, what would you expect the coefficient B1 to equal? If there was no difference. Zero, zero. So in fact, if we go back and look at this plot, if there was actually no linear correlation between father's height and son height, we would expect just a random scatter of points, and then the line that fit through it would be one that has a slope of zero, a slope of zero. So what we see here is that B1 is the difference in the expected heights of sons whose father's heights differ by one inch. So for every one inch increase in father's height, what would we expect to see in son's height? We'd expect to see about a half inch increase in son's height. So, so if a father's height went from 62 inches to 63 inches, we would expect the, the um, corresponding son's height to go from some value to one to half of an inch or 0.52 inches higher. So this linear relationship that describes the relationship between son's height and father's height was one that Galton originally termed as a reversion to the mean. So this all could have been called reversion analysis, but in fact it's, been, it's uh, the term that has taken hold is regression analysis. So it says that although there's a one unit increase in the father's height, on average the son's height will only increase by 0.52 inches. So there's a regression of the son's height to the mean height for sons in describing this linear relationship. So that's just to make some sense of why we're calling this a regression analysis. We're regressing son's height, the y variable, on the father's height, the x variable. And there's a tendency for the y variable to re take values that are closer to the mean of the um, son's height. Well, let's see if we can make some sense of this then with a data set that looks at weight in pounds and blood pressure in millimeters of mercury. So we have um, individuals here that each have a weight and each have a blood pressure. So we have, um, I believe, 15 different observations. And we would see that if we had just looked at blood pressure, regardless of weight, we had just looked at blood pressure. The mean blood pressure was 117.5 milligrams, um, millimeters of mercury. And the sample variance that we would calculate, just as we calculated S squared before, looking at the difference between each blood pressure and the mean blood pressure, um, is S squared of 74.3 units squared. And the sample standard deviation is 8.6. Now, we'll graph this and look at this, and our question of interest 
will, will be, how much of the variability that we see in blood pressure can really be explained by potentially a linear relationship or correlation between weight and blood pressure. So how much of the variability in blood pressure is due to its relationship with weight? So here's a graph. We're looking at just each of those points, 15 points, um, in which we have the weight for one individual and its corresponding blood pressure. So we'd visually inspect this. Does there appear to be a linear relationship? Yeah, a positive, potentially a positive linear relationship. There appears to be about the same variability across all values of weight, the same variability in blood pressure um, across all values of weight. And then if we used the least squares um, estimates for the intercept and the slope, we would see that the best fitting line, which minimizes all of the square differences of each point from the line, takes the form that the predicted line equals an intercept of negative 7.209 plus a slope of 0.715 times the x variable of weight. So how would we interpret this? We would say that when weight is equal to zero, again, and not a very interpretable um, intercept, but when eight, weight is equal to zero, the blood pressure is negative 7.209. Can we really interpret this line anywhere outside of the weights that were in this data set? No. It doesn't make sense to look at um, predicting values that are less than 150 or values that are greater than 190 because this line is based on just the observations in this range of weights. So taking weight equals to zero, negative 7.209 makes no sense. The relationship could have changed dramatically for lower weights or for higher weights. So we have a straight line that we're able to use for prediction. I've put as well the sample correlation coefficient here of 0.9. So remember, a value of positive 1 would have indicated what? A perfect positive linear relationship, meaning each of those observations would have fallen perfectly on the straight line. This one's not bad, 0.9, indicating a strong positive linear relationship. So our interpretation of this simple linear regression line is that based on the data that we had with 15 subjects, the estimated change in blood pressure per one pound change in weight, so this slope indicates that for each one unit increase in weight or one pound increase in weight, blood pressure increases by 0.715 millimeters of mercury. And there are techniques as well for calculating a confidence interval on that estimated slope, based on the estimated slope. And in fact, if we calculated one, we would see that we have 95% confidence that the true change in blood pressure per unit change in weight ranges from 0.51 up to 0.92 millimeters of mercury. So I'm 95% confident that this interval that ranges from 0.5 up to about 0.9 contains the true change. And I could use this in um, a prediction sense. Suppose that I had a value that wasn't contained in the data set uh, of a person who weighed 175 pounds. I could plug in 175 for weight and estimate the blood pressure as 118 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so we can use this for prediction as well as describing the straight line relationship. So in summary, we said the correlation coefficient was 0.9, indicating a strong positive correlation. There's something that's also known as the coefficient of determination, which just takes the correlation coefficient and squares it. That value, 0.9 squared, is 0.81. That we would interpret that as saying that 81% of the variability in blood pressure can be explained by its linear relationship with weight. So I'm going to take you back and just look at that plot again. Remember this um, plot. If you removed the x-axis from your mind, everybody do that, remove the x-axis, and then shift all of these points to just line up on the y-axis. And if we looked at the mean, which we said was about 117, and we thought about the variability in the points about their mean, that's what the sample variance reflected. 
that sample variance of 74.3 units squared reflected the variability in the Ys, in the blood pressures about their mean, but didn't account for the linear relationship that we're seeing between weight and height. So in other words, some of this variability in blood pressure is influenced or due to its relationship with weight. When weight is high, blood pressure is high. When weight is low, blood pressure is low. So our attempt as well is to be able then to interpret this um, coefficient of determination, r squared, as how much of the variability is due to this linear relationship. And in fact, what we would find from interpreting the output that we'll look at in a moment is that there's a better estimate of the variability in the blood pressures for each given weight. And that estimate is reduced um, from what we saw before, which was, do you recall? Anybody? If you don't recall, we're going to look at it in a moment. But the better estimate is 14.8. So if you go with me through an exercise that's not going to take you through the mathematics, but just a way of understanding that with um, a regression analysis, we can partition the total variability in the outcome into how much variability is due to the relationship between y and x and how much is just leftover variability that's due to random error, measurement error, relationships with other variables. So we're actually going to split, just like we did when we looked at analysis of variance for comparing differences in means, we're going to split the total variability into two parts. Variability that's due to the regression. In other words, think of it as just the variability that's explained by the linear relationship between x and y, and then the error variability, in other words, the leftover variability. So what I'd like to point out to you here is that this one value of 74.3 took the, what's known as the total sums of squares, just the difference between each blood pressure and its mean squared, divided by the total degrees of freedom, the sample size minus 1, to give us the sample variance. So even though it's not labeled here, this value of 74.3 is no different than S squared, the sample variance. OK? We saw that number before, 74.3. Now, when we remove the, what's due to this linear regression model or relationship, we actually see that the residual or the leftover variability is now reduced to 14.8 units squared. So if I looked back at the line and I thought of how much variability is there for any given, let's look at 180, how much variability is there in blood pressure for any given x? The estimate of the variance is 14.3. It's not 74.3. Two, it's reduced because we now have removed, we've re, it's 14.8 because we've removed the variability that was re, resulting from the linear relationship between weight and blood pressure. We'll look at this again with an example, but I wanted to just indicate that there's another purpose. What else could we look at here? We could look at the coefficients. Here was our, the constant is the intercept of negative 7.2. The coefficient for weight is the slope of 0.715 that we calculated before. There are ways of calculating t-test and testing null hypotheses that the slope is equal to zero. So here, on the first line where it's indicated weight, is a null hypothesis that the slope equals zero. And we see a p-value of zero, indicating that we, can't re that we can reject the null hypothesis that the slope is zero. In fact, there appears to be this positive linear relationship reflected in a positive slope. And here's the 95% confidence interval for the true slope that I was quoting earlier. In summary, a um, simple linear regression analysis allows us to look at the linear relationship between one predictor variable and another um, response variable. 
It allows us to look at how strong the linear relationship or correlation is between two variables. It provides us with a method for predicting the value of y based on x. And we could get into more complicated areas by extending this to multiple predictor variables with multiple linear regression. But I'm hoping that we've um, been able to talk just about the fundamentals of a simple linear regression, looking at one, co one covariate x and its relationship with a dependent variable y. So I have um, both an applet that I'd like to show you um, that helps visualize this straight line relationship. So this is one of the applets on the list that allows us to, um, to actually show both the regression line and the errors or the residuals. So I'm going to just make up a data set and see what happens. <laughs> Depending on where the points are, it very uh, greatly influences. So here I have really no linear relationship. And it's reflected in the fact that we do have this line here that's, um, that basically has a slope of 0. Um, here's the slope, 0.08. Now I'll clear that. If I had a very strong linear relationship, see what happens? I'm able to um, see. But if I have one point over here, the line changes. Have two points over there, the slope of the line changes, the intercept changes. Suppose I had a couple points down here. So the slope of the line and the um, intercept are going to change dramatically depending on, on the size of the data set as well as the, um, some influential points. So you can play with this and see how the regre regression line changes. So what we can do here is um, open up the data set that corresponded to the um, data that just, we just had. So if I graphed, remember we were interested in blood pressure as the y variable, weight as the, OK, as the um, independent variable. Here we see this scatter plot that's showing what appears to be a positive linear relationship between the two variables. Now, if I just ignored weight and summarized blood pressure, Here's where I have 15 observations. The mean was 117.5. The standard deviation was 8.6, which means the sample variance is this value squared, which, which was the 74.2. So we saw that it went from a minimum of 102 to 132. The variability, um, let me just add the details so you can see the variance as well. Whoops. Detail. So what I have here is variance of 74.3, sample variance. Now, if I perform the um, regression analysis of blood pressure on weight, what I see, again, is that that 74.3, which is the sample variance. But the um, regression analysis of variance partitions the total variability into the variability that can be explained by the model, in other words, the linear relationship between blood pressure and weight, and then the leftover or error or residual. And so here's where we see that once we account for that relationship, our best estimate of the variance for a given weight, the best estimate of variance in blood pressure is reduced to 14.7. Okay. So, well, I think I'm going to um, stop here and see if you have any questions. Yes, there's a question. Keep that on. Yes, <laughs> I will. Okay. The real clinical question is whether or not weight causes the blood pressure to go up. Right. So I have two, two basic data, or two. Two uh, variables. Two, well, uh, two conclusions or two um, analyses up here. One is the R squared. Okay. So people will say that the R squared is 0.81. Right. But what does the R squared actually measure? The relation, does that tell you that increasing weight makes the blood pressure go up? Or does that just tell you that your points describe a straight line? No. So there's a couple of things. This is a good question. There are two things we can interpret, both the correlation coefficient as well as the slope. So if we look first at that slope, which was 0 0.715, we would say that would tell us that with each one pound increase in weight, 
there's a 0.714 millimeter of mercury increase in blood pressure. Well, that also translates that for every 10 pound increase in weight, there's 10 times that, or a 7.14 millimeter mercury increase in blood pressure. Or we could do the same for a 20 pound increase in weight, it's um, a 14 unit increase in blood pressure. So we would use that as our estimate to say, you know, there appears to be this positive relationship between increased weight, increases blood pressure. Can we say it's a causal relationship? No, not necessarily. I'd prefer to term it as an association at this point. But I can also look at the 95% confidence interval, interpret it, and that tells me that for every one pound increase in weight, the increase in blood pressure may be as low as a half of a millimeter of mercury up to as high as one unit, 0.9 millimeters of mercury. But again, translating it into a 10 pound increase in weight, I could say it's somewhere between, could be somewhere between five to nine millimeters increase. So I'd interpret that slope to begin with. Now how do we interpret the R and the R squared? Remember. The R value itself, the correlation coefficient of 0.9, indicates a very high, a very strong positive linear correlation between those two variables. The R squared, the coefficient of determination, allows us to make an interpretation that of, out of all of the variability that we see in blood pressure, we can actually account for 81% of it by its relationship with weight. 19% is not explained by the linear relationship with weight. But 81% is. What's the other 19% due to? As we said, it could be measurement error, random error, relationship with other variables. But 81% is a large proportion of variability accounted for by this linear relationship. Follow-up question? So when I'm reporting this data in a paper, right. you would give the R squared value, but other people sometimes include a p-value. Right. I would give the, um, actually, I would give the regression line, and I would talk about the slope, and I would give the 95% confidence interval for the slope, and I probably would also give um, either the R or the R squared in addition to it. Now, the p-value that someone would have reported with this small data set of 15 would have been this p-value here that either, um, which we see it's zero, this p-value is testing the null hypothesis that the true slope, the true change in blood pressure per unit change in weight, is equal to zero. So that p-value just allows us to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis that the slope is equal to zero. Um, you might also see another p-value that's reflected in a comparison of the variability due to the model compared to the leftover variability. It happens to also be a p-value equal to zero. Now, is that p-value as informative as the confidence interval? Maybe not. Maybe not. So I would think giving this information that says for a 10-pound increase in weight, we may see somewhere between a 5 to 9 millimeter increase in blood pressure. Um, is, is more relevant.